A well-disciplined enemy will not be driven from his position by fire alone. Making full use of cover and concealment, he will remain in his position until driven out in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The rifle and the bayonet used in a skillful and aggressive manner are the best weapons to drive an enemy from his position, either in trench or in open warfare. The will to use the bayonet must be instilled in all men. This spirit, combined with confidence in the rifle and with the ability to shoot, enables the firing line to close with and destroy the enemy. This is the overwhelming influence behind every successful bayonet assault. Each man must be taught to think and act for himself and that there is no interval between thought and action. Physical agility and mental alertness are taught by various quickening exercises and games that require quick thinking and instantaneous muscular response. The bayonet is essentially an offensive weapon. The bayonet fighter rushes straight at an opponent with a point threatening his throat and delivers a thrust whenever an opening presents itself. If no opening is obvious, one must be made by deflecting the opponent's piece and continuing to bore in. The thrust must be driven home at the first opening. A fifth of a second's delay may cause a man to lose his life. For preliminary instruction, the group is lined up in a single rank with an interval of three paces between men. The first position in which the soldier is instructed is guard. The rifle is held firmly but not rigidly with both hands without canting. The point of the rifle is directed at the opponent's throat. The left hand, palm against the side of the rifle, is at the most convenient position in front of the rear sight so that the left arm is only slightly bent. The right hand, palm to the left, grasps the small of the stock and the right forearm presses the upper part of the butt to the body. The legs are separated as in taking a natural step and meeting with resistance, with the left foot leading and both knees slightly bent. The position is not constrained in any way, but is one of aggressiveness, alertness, and readiness to spring forward in instant attack. One of three methods may be used to take the guard position. First, throw the piece forward with the right hand, grasping it simultaneously with both hands in the guard position. Second, move the rifle forward with the left hand, grasp it with the right. Third, Move the rifle forward with both hands between the bands and re-grasp with the right hand at the small of the stock. The next demonstration will show some of the common errors made in taking the guard position. Cut. Well, that looks pretty good. Can you feel ready to attack in any direction? Yes, sir. All right, jump around a bit. Let's see. All right. Press. Cut. Your left arm should be bent slightly. See there, you didn't have the butt of the rifle braced. Keep the rifle braced between the forearm and the body. Take it. Oh. If the arm is straight, then uh, when you thrust, step forward to thrust, you will not impart a darting effect to the point. Watch. See that? The point goes forward the same speed the body does. Makes it easy to evade. But if the arm is bent slightly, then when you straighten it when you thrust, you impart a darting effect which makes it hard to judge. See that? All right, now take the correct position. That's better. Rest. Cut. Yeah, keep the keep the point of the bayonet pointed up, opponent's throat. 
That'll have demoralizing effect on him, cause him to flinch. When you advance on him, you wave back and forth in front of his eyes. Also, keep the barrel up, otherwise the your bayonet guard will get hung up on your opponent's piece. That's a defensive position. Always keep the barrel up, and then you can shove right on through with your stroke. All right, take the correct position now. That's better. Rest. Cut. You're holding your muscles too tense. Hold the rifle firmly, but not rigidly. If your muscles are tense, you have to relax them to bring them into play again. Another thing, your feet are too much in line. You notice how easily you were pushed off balance. Now here's the way the feet should be. Assume that you're walking along and you meet with some resistance. The feet are separated laterally, both knees slightly bent, weight equally on the balls of both feet, so that you can shift around and attack in any direction. Not tense and tight like that, but relax. Get the idea? Yes, sir. All right, take the correct position. That's better. Press. Hark. Well, your position is not aggressive enough. You're leaning back too far. Lean forward this way. That's it. Better. Your right foot is pointed to the right. You're what we call a ground gripper. The foot should be pointed as in walking to the front. If you turn your foot to the right, as it is now, when you thrust, you'll hold yourself back in that way. We want you to place the feet so that when you thrust, you'll be thrown off balance forward and will have to take another step to maintain your balance. Watch me. Watch me deliver this thrust here. Notice, carry it into your opponent. That's exactly what we want. As long as you stand off, you're at a disadvantage, but you're at an advantage if you get in close to him. All right, now take the position correctly. Get the right foot around more, as in walking. Get a good flexible position. That's it. Rest. Heart. That's a good position. You feel all right, ready to attack in any direction? Yes, sir. Jump around a bit, let's see. All right, press. To continue executing the movements by command will produce mechanical execution, deaden the initiative, develop hesitation, and ignore the training of the soldier's eye. Direct appeal to the brain by signals through the eye must be used as early and as much as practicable. To signal guard, assume the position of guard, left hand at back, right elbow at the side, the right forearm pointing to the front with the fist clenched. Signals indicate an opening which the soldier sees and acts upon without delay or hesitation. Each soldier must be taught to think and act for himself and as far as possible to execute the exercises without command. To assume the position of short guard, the left hand grasps the rifle just under the stacking swivel. The left arm is slightly bent. The right hand grasps the small of the stock and rests against the right hip. The point of the bayonet is directed at the base of the opponent's throat. The position of the body Legs and feet are the same as in the guard position. The errors common to guard also apply to the short guard. The signal for short guard is the same as for guard, except that the arm is drawn straight to the rear until the fist is at the right side.
The next position is high port. From the guard, without changing the grasp of the hands, carry the rifle diagonally across the body until the left wrist is level with and in front of the left shoulder. The position of high port is habitually taken when advancing to the immediate assault in jumping trenches or in surmounting obstacles. In jumping trenches, the rifle is thrown forward on the takeoff and brought to high port or guard in landing. To assume the position of rest from guard, lower the piece smartly to the side, with the butt resting on the ground near the right foot and the right hand grasping the piece above the lower band. The feet remain as in the position of guard. The position of rest is taken frequently to permit physical relaxation after vigorous and aggressive execution of the various movements. Men remain on the alert mentally, ready to execute quickly indicated movements. Speed is an important factor in bayonet training. The whirl provides a rapid movement to face in a new direction. Men must be instructed to whirl about and to deliver a thrust, a butt stroke, or a blow in a decisive, aggressive manner. To whirl about from a run with the piece at high port, whirl about on the ball of the left foot and plant the right foot firmly. At the same time, snap the piece down and assume the guard position. If at a halt in the guard position, bring the rifle to high port, and if the left foot is advanced, whirl to the left about on the ball of the left foot to gain distance. Whirl to the right on the ball of the right foot if it is desired to close in. In this manner, the rifle is brought to guard as the whirl is completed. If the right foot is advanced, Whirl to the right about on the ball of the right foot to gain distance, and to the left about on the ball of the left foot to close in. Here are some of the common errors of the whirl. Distance was not gained in this whirl, with the result that the point of the bayonet was beyond that of the opponent. It is best to gain distance when whirling about to meet an attack from the rear, to avoid whirling into the bayonet point of the opponent. The whirl should be executed without hesitation. Also, keep your point between yourself and your opponent. This is an excellent whirl. It put the point of the bayonet in a threatening position. If the rifle is kept at guard while whirling, as in this case, the point may go beyond an opponent closing in rapidly. By bringing the piece to high port, the piece will be in a position to fend off blows as one whirls. When the positions of guard, high port, rest, and the whirl have been taught, the section is now ready for instruction in the execution of the various movements. The section is formed for bayonet training in two ranks, ten yards apart, facing in, and with three paces between men. The position of guard is assumed. At the signal to assemble, each man comes to high port and runs to his position in the section. Each man, except the base man, runs directly to his proper position, taking the guard position on arrival. 
This formation provides each man a target at which to direct the various thrusts and strokes. Exercises are practiced slowly by the numbers, beginning with the guard and rest positions. Later, as proficiency is increased, the speed is increased, so that ultimately an entire sequence of movements can be executed without hesitation. The point of the bayonet should be directed at the opponent's throat, especially in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so that a few inches penetration will easily inflict a fatal wound. Other vulnerable and frequently exposed parts are the face, the chest, the lower abdomen, the thighs, and when the back is turned, the kidneys. The armpits and throat are especially vulnerable to the jab. The long thrust is the most effective blow that can be delivered from the guard position. The rifle is gripped with all possible strength and the point is driven vigorously from the guard position to the full extent of the left arm, while the entire body is extended quickly to the front and the butt runs along the inside of and against the right forearm. The left arm is used more to direct the point of the bayonet. In delivering the thrust, the right elbow is carried low, with the butt of the rifle remaining between the right forearm and the body. The leading knee and ankle are well bent. The rear leg is braced with the heel raised, and the body is inclined well forward. The power of the thrust comes from the right arm, the shoulders, the back, the legs, and the weight of the body. A vigorous thrust delivered without advancing throws a man off balance, but in fighting he preserves his balance by stepping in immediately after the thrust has been delivered. After a man has learned the details of the thrust, he will always deliver it while advancing. The eyes must be fixed on the target of the thrust. In making thrusts other than straight to the front, the leading left foot should move laterally in the direction in which the thrust is to be made at an opponent at a range of five feet from the attacker's eye. The darting forward of the point at the last instant gives it added speed, making it more difficult to judge. And cut! That's very good thrust. Had lots of power and dart in it. Body's well extended. Leading knee and ankle are well bent. Body's braced between your right forearm and your body. Very good. Recover. Long cut. Recover. Now you made the error of drawing, of telegraphing your thrust by drawing the rifle back just before your thrust. Like this. That enables your opponent to avoid the thrust. Remember that quickness and deception are important factors in bayonet fighting. Don't let your opponent know when you're going to thrust. To do this, you must thrust out from the guard position. You get sufficient power by straightening the left arm and stepping into the rear foot. Watch me in this manner. Get the idea? All right, try it. Long cut. That's better. Notice the darting effect you got to the point there. Straight out. Recover. 
Long thrust! Well, the butt of your rifle is too low. Not braced. Show you what'll happen when that's the case. Powerful parry might twist the rifle out of your hands that way. All right, step back. Now, in delivering the thrust, you brace the butt to prevent the rifle from being twisted out of your hand. And you do that by carrying the right elbow low as the thrust is made. Notice the right elbow is down, and the butt is braced between the body and the right forearm. You should always do that when thrusting. Try it. Long cut. That's better. Recover. Long cut. All right, recover. Ah, the fault you made there was that you straightened the arm too soon before you stepped in with your thrust. The result was that the point moved forward at the same speed as the body, making it easy to sidestep. The thrust is delivered by stepping into the rear foot, straightening the arm just a fraction of a second before the rear foot is planted forward. That then imparts a darting effect and assures the weight of the body being behind the thrust. Watch me. Notice the dart there, the weight behind the thrust. All right. Try it. Long thrust. That's much better. Recover. Long thrust. Recover. Well, that thrust was all right except that the point did not travel on a straight line to the mark, but it dropped as it moved forward, like that. Now, to take instant advantage of an opening, the point must travel along the shortest line to the mark. That also gives it more penetrating power, like this. Right at the mark. Get the idea? That's All right, try it again. Cut! Long cut! That's better. Recover. Long thrust. Your body is too erect. In delivering the thrust, the body's inclined forward, so the leading knee and ankle are well bent. That increases the reach and also gives greater power to the thrust. Now come forward, way forward. That's it. Get well behind the piece that way. All right, execute it. Long thrust. Good. To signal long thrust, place the right palm, fingers apart and extended, to that part of the body toward which the thrust is to be made. To withdraw the bayonet following a long thrust, the left hand is slipped toward the stacking swivel, the rifle is jerked straight back along the line of penetration with the force and weight of the body until the right hand is behind the hip. This without unduly relaxing the grip on the small of the stock. Notice that the weight of the body is carried to the rear by straightening out the leading leg and the body at the waist. The foot in rear will be advanced quickly as the left hand is slipped forward, unless the proximity of the transfixed object renders it unnecessary. Some of the errors of the withdrawal will be illustrated next. Here the butt of the rifle is dropped, making withdrawal slow and difficult and straining the bayonet. Notice that the butt of the piece almost touches the ground. 
This man cants his rifle. This increases the difficulty of withdrawal and may cause the bayonet to hang up on the transfixed object and be broken. Only the arms are used here. The weight of the body must be thrown into the action to force quick withdrawal. There is no force to the withdrawal as this man does it. This man throws himself off balance. A man must be in a position upon completion of the withdrawal to move about and resume the attack. The point of the bandit is dropped a little too low here. After instruction has been completed in the positions of guard, long thrust and withdrawal, the instructor demonstrates the sequence of movements to a group under instruction. The movements are to be executed slowly at first and the speed increased as the group becomes more and more proficient. Here is a group under instruction. All right, this time we'll execute long thrust, withdrawal, back to guard in sequence by the numbers first. Now then, you'll execute long thrust and hold. Hup. Now at two, you step up with the rear foot, slide the left hand to the stacking swivel. Hup. Next, you'll withdraw. Hup. Back to guard. Whirl, hup. back to places. This time, you'll execute the long thrust with the one, two, and hold. Hup. With paw. Back to guard. Whirl, hup. back to places. Entire sequence. Hop. Oh. Res. Entire sequence. Hop. Following this, the class working in pairs and without command practices the execution of the movements by thrusting at the opposite man's hand as it is placed in various positions on the body. Crossover exercises, including the movements covered to date, may be used to give variety and interest. The section is then trained to thrust at a disc or circle painted on a dummy at a distance of about five feet. Later the distance is increased to several paces. The bayonet is withdrawn and a forward threatening attitude is assumed immediately at the side of or beyond the dummy. This man rushed the dummy and permitted the weight of his body to carry the bayonet into the target without thrusting. This should not be done. On the other hand, rushing a dummy and gently pricking it with the point of the bayonet because of misjudged distance or faulty use of the arms should not be done. Rush at a dummy at top speed. Execute a vigorous, aggressive thrust and a withdrawal. These drills should be practiced throughout the entire course of instruction in bayonet training.
From a position of guard, short guard is assumed by shifting the left hand quickly toward the muzzle and drawing the rifle back until the right hand is against the right hip without unduly relaxing the grasp on the small of the stock or moving the butt of the piece upward or downward. The point is at the height of the neck. The short thrust is vigorously delivered to the full extent of the left arm as in the long thrust. When immediately preceded by the long thrust, the short thrust is delivered from the position of withdrawal from the long thrust. It is delivered vigorously to the full extent of the left arm. Errors are common to those of the long thrust. The signal for the short thrust is the same as for the long thrust, except that the fist is closed. Proper position for the movement is taken when necessary upon the signal short thrust. The withdrawal from the short thrust will be practiced in two ways. First, in the same manner as from the long thrust. Second, if a strong withdrawal is necessary or the short thrust is to be followed immediately by the jab, the right hand is slipped up in the rear of the left hand and a forceful withdrawal is made similar to that from the long thrust in this manner. The errors are similar to those of the withdrawal from the long thrust. The instructor demonstrates the sequence to include the withdrawal from the short thrust. All right, now we will execute the sequence. Long thrust withdrawal, short thrust withdrawal. Back to guard in detail. Cut! We'll execute long thrust withdrawal and hold. Cut. Now then, from this position, step in, deliver your short thrust and hold. Hup. Now next, you will step up with the rear foot. At the same time, bring the right hand to a position immediately below the left. Hup. Now then, with a the downward pressure of the left hand and upward pressure of the right, yank the piece straight back. Hup. Back to guard. Whirl, hop, back to your places. Long thrust, withdrawal, and hold. Hop. Now then, step in, deliver your short thrust to the one, two, and hold. Hop. Yank it back. Back to guard. Whirl, hop, back to your places. Entire sequence. Hop. Lots of drive. Rest. By placing two or more circles on the dummies, the short thrust may be taught in conjunction with the long thrust. The first disc transfixed by the long thrust, the second by the short thrust. The jab is the movement immediately following the withdrawal from the short thrust. The rifle is brought to an almost vertical position close to the body along the outside of the right leg with the butt near the right foot. From this position, or stepping in if necessary, with the knee bent using the full force of the body, the bayonet is jabbed upward into the throat or other parts of the enemy. We have seen the movement in slow motion. Here is another view of the movement. Notice that the force of the body is placed behind the jab. Now we will see the jab at normal speed. The section now demonstrates some of the common errors. This is a correct jab. The rifle was not pressed against the leg. 
Pressing the rifle against the leg during the jab ensures it's traveling in a straight line. The right hand is too low. If both hands are close together, it is easier to direct the point and apply more speed and power. This man uses his arms only and does not put the power of the shoulders and body behind the jab. This jab is too high and not vigorous. It must be a short, vigorous and sharp movement to cause the bayonet to penetrate. The signal for the jab is given by placing both closed fists under the chin. The instructor demonstrates the sequence of movements to include the jab. All right, now we'll execute the sequence. Long thrust withdrawal, short thrust withdrawal, and jab. Execute long thrust, short thrust, withdrawal, and hold. Hup. Now then, from this position, you will jump forward. At the same time, lower the butt of the rifle so that the rifle is almost to a vertical position, keeping the stock of the rifle against the right thigh. Hup. Now, by straightening the legs vigorously and hunching the shoulders, Deliver a jab at your opponent's throat twice. Hup! Back to guard. Pearl, hup! Back to your places. Entire sequence, lots of pep. Let's go. Hup! Press! Well, that sequence was executed all right as far as the movements of the band and the feet were concerned. But you, ex you made one bad fall. You hesitated, paused between your movements. You executed that sequence too much in cadence. Somewhat like this. And so on. You've got to have drive in your execution of these movements. It's very important that there be no time between execution of movements. There's no object in waiting once you've made a delivered a blow to execute the next one. Time is an important factor. You could execute those, that sequence somewhat like this. Get the idea? Always get the point back immediately. Ready in position to hit, or hitting, or recovering from a hit. Don't pause between your movements. Drive right on through with it. All right, try it again now. Ready, hop! It is important that the bayonet fighter keep the point between himself and his opponent. In case the opponent sidesteps, a rapid withdrawal will put the point in position to jab. The movement is executed slowly at first, and later the speed is increased. The coach jumps back after each signal to permit the pupil to execute the movements and to have a target at which to aim. At first, the coach moves back in a straight line. Later, he changes direction. Men are further trained in the sequence of positions by the use of the coach and pupil method. Starting from guard position, long thrust, withdrawal, short thrust, withdrawal, and jab are executed in sequence. Group exercises follow, with each member of the pairs alternately acting as coach and pupil. Mental alertness coupled with speed and accuracy of execution are taught by this method. Other drills involving different arrangements of the movements covered so far may be used to give variety and to retain interest.
the parry right from the position of guard. The body is thrust forward to the full extent of the reach, and the left arm is straightened vigorously without bending the wrists or twisting the rifle in the hands, at the same time engaging the opponent's piece and deflecting it just clear of the body. The barrel is kept up with a point threatening the opponent's body, preferably the throat. This shows how the opponent's piece is engaged with a point threatening the throat. Note that very little lateral movement is necessary to deflect the point of the opponent's piece and to make an opening to drive home a thrust. The parry right is normally followed by a thrust or a butt stroke. This shows parry right, long thrust, withdrawal, and back to guard in slow motion. Here it is at normal speed. In the parry left, the point is carried out of line with the opponent's body, but can be brought back quickly as it is nearer the line than the opponent's point. The parry is an offensive movement and should be executed with a forward movement of the body and a small lateral movement of the piece. The eyes follow the opponent's piece during the parry and then are fixed on the point of attack on the opponent's body. The parry left is followed immediately with a thrust or a butt stroke to the ribs or jaw. Following the demonstrations by the instructor, the various errors are pointed out. This parry is correctly done. This parry is made with too much lateral movement and not enough forward movement. A wide parry gives no advantage over the opponent because your point is as far from his body as his point is from your body. The object is to deflect his piece clear of your body and to keep your point directed on him. This man does not keep his eyes on the opponent's piece. As soon as the parry is completed, the eyes are instantly fixed on that part of the opponent's body to be attacked. The arms only are used in this parry with no force behind the movement. A quick, sharp, powerful blow with strength and momentum of the body behind it must be used to deflect the opponent's piece. This man crosses his arms in making the parry, getting into an awkward position from which it is difficult to recover quickly and exposing himself to attack or a loss of his piece during the movement. This man executes the parry in an excellent manner, with lots of drive and speed. To signal a parry, strike a blow diagonally across the body in the direction of the parry, with the fists closed. Men will be taught to execute the parries upon signal. The parry may now be used in the sequence of movements, on signal. The group is now instructed in the sequence of movements to include the parries. The training stick is used for instruction in parrying. Working in pairs, one man thrusts the padded end of the stick and the other man parries the blow. 
Each pair works independently with the instructor supervising the exercises. This shows the correct use of the parry stick. This man is swinging the stick into the pupil from the side, causing a wide sweeping parry by the pupil. The parry stick should be thrust in a straight line at the pupil to force him to parry with a forward movement. Just fooling. This may be lots of fun, but it is not good training. Don't hesitate and don't make false starts or signals. Such actions cause hesitation and delay, which are fatal defects in bayonet fighting. Later, the pupil is taught to execute a parry, followed by a long thrust, a withdrawal, and back to guard position. One end of the stick has a rope loop through which a thrust is made when that end is presented. The training stick is used in this work with the pupil increasing his speed and vigor as his proficiency increases. The coach and pupil method is used with the pairs alternating with the stick. Here the entire group is at work with each pair executing the movements independently under the supervision of the instructor. In making vertical butt stroke number one, swing the butt of the rifle upward at the opponent's crotch, ribs, forearm, or any exposed portion of the body using a half arm blow, and at the same time step in with a rear foot. This is a powerful stroke. Note the glaring errors. This man swings the butt too high above his face and exposes his body to attack. Always be prepared to fend off or deliver another blow. This man keeps his arm too straight and is off balance. It should be a half arm movement with the muscles and the momentum of the body giving force to the blow. From a horizontal position above the shoulder, resulting from a miss on butt stroke number one, the attacker jumps forward and dashes the butt of the rifle into the opponent's face in this manner. This man makes the blow too low with loss of accuracy, power, and balance and exposes himself. The butt should move in a straight line to the target. Having missed the blow, the attacker closes in again and slashes his bayonet on the opponent's head or neck. In the event of a miss again, the attacker will be back in the guard position. This man makes his blow in a vertical arc so that it would strike the opponent's helmet. The slash should be executed diagonally at the junction of the neck and shoulders. If the point is beaten or brought down during the slash, the butt can be used effectively by crashing it down with an overarm blow. If the opponent is still out of distance, return to the guard position.
This man makes the movement too wide and exposes the body to attack. The various vertical butt strokes in sequence are number one, the uppercut blow at an exposed portion of the body. Number two, a crashing drive to the head with the butt of the piece. The slash downward aimed at the opponent's neck and shoulders. Vertical butt stroke number three, crashing over and down on the head of the opponent. And back to guard. After the demonstration of the sequence by the instructor, the group practices the various vertical butt strokes. An uppercut with the right fist signals butt stroke number one. Straight right from the shoulder indicates butt stroke number two. To signal slash, carry the right hand upward over the right shoulder with fingers extended and joined and slash downward. An overarm blow indicates the vertical butt stroke number three. The men are next trained to go through the vertical butt strokes in sequence by use of signals. Speed is increased as the groups become more proficient. Next, horizontal butt stroke number one. With a half arm blow, swing the piece at the opponent's jaw while advancing the rear foot. This man makes an excellent stroke. This man makes his stroke too wide and uncovers himself and loses his balance. He is not ready to deliver another blow. This man's arms are too straight. He loses power and accuracy. The momentum of the body and the power of the shoulders should be behind the blow. This man uses his arms only. This gives a weak, puny blow, lacking the driving power of the body. If the opponent jumps back and the first blow misses, the rifle is above the left shoulder. The attacker will jump in and dash the butt of the piece into the opponent's face or slash the bayonet against the opponent's neck. And back to guard. The errors are similar to those of the vertical butt stroke number two and the vertical slash. The signal for horizontal butt stroke number one is given by making a right hook. For number two, straight from the right shoulder with a fist closed. For the slash, carry the right hand upward over the right shoulder with fingers extended and joined and slash downward. A quick review of all signals. Guard. Short guard. Long thrust. 
Short thrust. Jab. Parry right. Parry left. Vertical butt stroke number one. Vertical butt stroke number two. Slash. Vertical butt stroke number three. Horizontal butt stroke number one. Horizontal butt stroke number two. And slash. A review of the movements from guard to jab inclusive in slow motion. Guard. Long thrust. Withdrawal. Short thrust. Withdrawal. Jab. And back to guard. The training stick is used to obtain good direction and quickness in the use of the bayonet. The men work in pairs as coach and pupil. One end of the stick is padded and the other has a rope ring. Parries and butt strokes are made with a padded end. Thrusts and jabs at the loop end. As the end of the stick touches the ground, the pupil comes to guard and attacks with a thrust, jab, parry, or butt stroke as the distance and end indicates. Squad exercises with a training stick are used to arouse interest and to teach quickness of action. Members form a large circle and execute the movements indicated by the man with the stick. A miss with a long thrust is followed by a withdrawal. Short thrust, withdrawal, jab. Presenting the padded end brings butt stroke number one. A miss, butt stroke number two, slash, and so on until the stick is hit or has been grounded. By having the members of the squad face outward, each must whirl about to execute the indicated movement. Much of the value of these exercises results from alertness and quick thinking by the man with the stick in keeping the members of the squad alert and in giving variety to the movements. Squad competitions may also be used to stir enthusiasm and interest. Each man in the line has his stick in position for one of the thrusts, butt strokes, or the jab. Flagrant loss of balance, useless movements of the piece, or a tendency toward wildness should be counted against the squad scores. These competitions should not be attempted until the men have attained a reasonable proficiency with a bayonet in those movements expected of them in the competition.
The first method of disarming an opponent armed with a rifle and bayonet. Close in fast and fend off the opponent's thrust with the right hand. Step forward and seize his left hand with both hands, your left over his palm, the right over his fingers. Make a sharp twist outward and upset your opponent by pushing him backward as you trip him with your right foot or leg. This time the action will be slightly faster. From another viewpoint, slowly. Now the pair demonstrates the method at full speed, changing places as each is disarmed. The second method, fend off the opponent's thrust with the right hand. Step in and grasp his rifle just below the bayonet with the left hand, back of hand down. At the same time, hack or grasp his left forearm with the right hand. And continuing to bear down on the arm, swing the rifle violently upward and over to the right. And step in and kick or bring the knee into the opponent's body. Slightly faster. And now at full speed. The third method. Fend off the opponent's thrust with the left hand. Step in and kick him in the crotch or on the shin. Grasp the rifle just below the bayonet with the right hand, back of hand down, and with the left hand grasp the top of the receiver. Swing the rifle upward and over to the left, and force the point of the bayonet to the ground. Step in and back heel the opponent at the same time. This time will be about half normal speed. And now at full speed. This demonstration shows the use of the three methods at the option of the defender. The scabbard is left on the bayonet to guard against injuries to the opponents. Practice in this work begins at a slow speed until the men have mastered the various holds and then the exercises are speeded up to approximate that of a regular bayonet attack. To disarm an opponent attacking with a knife in the overarm attack. Close in fast. With the left forearm, block the knife arm before it becomes extended.
Carry the right forearm in rear of the opponent's forearm and grasp your own forearm with the right hand. Backward pressure will cause the opponent to drop the knife and may break his elbow. In the underhand attack, as the blow comes upward, the disarmer steps quickly outside the thrust and knocks the arm aside with the left forearm. He then grasps the opponent's wrist with his right hand, at the same time carrying his left arm over and under the opponent's knife arm above the elbow. An upward pressure with the left arm and a twisting downward pressure with the right hand will cause the opponent to drop the knife and will probably break his elbow. Speed, aggressiveness, and accuracy are increased by men working in pairs and disarming each other by the various methods. Men are trained in teamwork. Whenever possible, two men attack one of the enemy. They attack one opponent at a time, and while one diverts his attention, the other attacks him from the exposed side. Each day during bayonet training, men should spend a short time in thrusting at dummies. The bayonet qualification course consists of eight dummies which are targets for parries, thrusts, jabs, and butt strokes. At the end of the course there are two E-targets representing a fleeing enemy. A cardboard disc, six inches in diameter, is pasted on each dummy except the butt stroke dummies and the jab dummy to provide targets for thrusts. On those dummies requiring a parry prior to the thrust, the cardboard disc is located so that it is necessary to make the parry in order to score a hit on the disc. All long thrust and butt stroke dummies are equipped with parry sticks. Dummies of this type require either parry right or left before executing the long thrust. This type of dummy requires a short thrust. This dummy requires a parry left and a horizontal butt stroke. This dummy also requires a parry left and a butt stroke, but in this case the butt stroke is vertical. This dummy requires a jab. These are the two targets which represent a fleeing enemy. The firing of one shot at each of these dummies must be simulated to complete the course. In running the course, the proper stroke, thrust, or parry must be made at each dummy as prescribed in the basic field manual on instruction with a bayonet. Judges start, time, and award all scores. 
The maximum score is 66 points. Each correctly executed parry scores two points. Execution of the proper thrust so as to cut the cardboard disc and penetrate the dummy scores six points for each target requiring a thrust. Each butt stroke dummy must be completely upset by the butt of the rifle for a score of six points each. A correct jab gets a score of six points. The correct simulation after arrival at the firing point of firing one round at each of two targets earns four points per target. Only one thrust, jab, or butt stroke per dummy will be allowed. Those running the course will wear the service uniform without hat or coat. No hobnails or spikes will be worn on the shoes. All men running the course will wear the web cartridge belt for the rifle. Failure to attack any dummy or to simulate firing at least one aimed round gets a score of zero for the trial. Time required in excess of 40 seconds cancels all score credits. Let us observe more in detail how the course is run. The soldier takes the prone position in rear of the starting point. At the command up, he springs to his feet and with a rifle at high port runs toward the first dummy. He assumes the guard position five paces from the dummy and arriving in proper position, executes a parry left, long thrust and withdrawal at number one. At number two, he executes a parry left and a horizontal butt stroke. At number three, a parry left, long thrust and withdrawal. At number four, a short thrust withdrawal. At number five, a parry left and a vertical butt stroke. At number six, seven and eight in turn, a parry right, long thrust withdrawal, short thrust withdrawal, a jab. And then to the firing point, where the soldier must simulate loading and firing one aimed round at each of the two E targets from a standing position without sling and with battle sight. This time the action will be at normal speed. In position, up, at number one, parry left, long thrust withdrawal. At two, parry left and horizontal butt stroke. At three, parry left, long thrust withdrawal. At four, short thrust withdrawal. At five, parry left, vertical butt stroke. Next, parry right, long thrust withdrawal, short thrust withdrawal, jab. And at the firing point, simulate loading and aiming one round at each target. These men have completed a thorough and aggressive course in bayonet training. They have ability and confidence in the rifle and bayonet and are instilled with a fighting spirit which they will carry to the battlefield. Fire alone will not drive a well-disciplined and determined enemy from a well-protected position. The bayonet will do the work. The enemy is pinned to the ground but cannot be driven out by fire. The section leader decides to close with him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bayonets are fixed and assault fire is used to subdue the enemy until the section is close enough to make a bayonet charge. The time has come for that charge. The enemy, fearing the threat of cold steel in the hands of a determined foe, gives up his position and flees in disorder.